Wow, that's a big question. Um, let, let me break it into parts. Mm -hmm. One, I think something needs to change. Yeah. Um, we are also at an interesting place economically where interest rates went up mm -hmm. and all the free money people were using to expand their studios and acquire users that weren't profitable mm -hmm. uh, suddenly became very expensive money. Yeah. And so these elements and a bunch of other elements, and I don't claim to be an economist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a writer. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I do read occasionally and try and make sense of things. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of elements that came together in this sort of perfect storm yeah. of that has crashed so many studios. Yeah. Um, and I do, do I think all of it was necessary? Absolutely not. Richard, thank you so much for your time. Um, I've been after a video game writer for a little bit of time. I've been trying to dig, dig around and find them uh, in wherever they, wherever they spend their time. And it's a bit hard to know where to start with you because you're, you're so prolific. Uh, I think I was reading it's, you've contributed to something like 130 role-playing pamphlets, eight novels, two short story collections. You've co-authored a book on writing. There's 20 to 30 games in various guises from writer to, to script doctoring to various things. You've done a lot. So I'm going to start at the beginning uh, or as far back as we can go, or at least that you can, that you can remember in terms of gaming and, and ask you what your first foray into gaming was uh, at a very early age. Young Richard, how did he get into gaming? What was, what was that experience? Uh, that was back in middle school. Um, mm -hmm. And... My mother was actually very encouraging of me getting into role-playing games. Right. Uh, she uh, loved fantasy literature and encouraged me to use my imagination. So she and my father bought me all sorts of role-playing books, many of which had nothing to do with one another. Yes. I, I still have the uh, James Bond 007 storyteller screen that she bought me. I have no idea why, but there it is. <laughs> um, but, you know, I started reading that stuff in middle school and... Uh, had a friend named Frank Rotman who was a big D and D fan, and mm -hmm. so we talked about a bunch of stuff back then. Yeah, um, and have found a group to play with in high school, um, and we blew through Dungeons and Dragons and Villains and Vigilantes and a bunch of the Chaosium systems, and uh, had a really good time. Um, got to college, ran a twenty-five person Villains and Vigilantes campaign. Yeah, and then I got into LARP, helping run LARPs. Yeah. Um, which I did, uh, helped co-found a group called The Quest Game while I was an undergraduate at Wesleyan. And nice. so we would run these 150-person LARPs in the uh, the woods of eastern Connecticut with uh, props built up on top of motorcycles and six-person dragons and <laughs> you know, foam swords beating the hell out of each other with the, with plumbing supplies in the middle of the night. It was great. It sounds, um, it sounds great. It sounds like a lot of lot of logistics there and, and potentially some injuries, but it sounds like a lot of fun. So it all started with with role playing the the, the yes. role playing games and, and then into actual live action role play. And did, did that because I think one of the things with um with you know those those kind of role playing games is I, I guess my knowledge is is limited there, but I guess as a dungeon master or, or someone that's running those games, there's there's a bit of artistic license kind of spattered in there, right? You're not you're not expected necessarily just to read it word for word, but but almost lift that from the page and and add your own flair to it. So, do you think that's where the kind of writing elements started? I, I've always been a bit of a storyteller. Um, I've loved storytelling my whole life. When when I was very young, I was very fact driven, and then mm -hmm. in third grade, I got chicken pox. And my mother decided it was time for me to read something that was not about dinosaurs or space. <laughs> um, and she uh, took all the other books out of my room and left me with the Chronicles of Narnia. Okay, an interesting one. Are and you a like, Narnia okay. guy or a Lord of the Rings guy, if we, if we put those two guys up against each other, as, as people seem to do? I, I don't put them up against each other. They're very different <laughs> things. Uh, they are. They are. They seem and... to put it up against each other, didn't they not? Well, they, I mean, Tolkien and Lewis were friends, so I mean... Yeah. I, I don't see the need for competition. The uh, the series, actually, of my youth that made the biggest impression was The Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. Right. Which was a um, a Welsh mythology-based young adult fantasy series. Right. And I love that series to this day. But, you know, when, once my mother turned me on to the fantasy fiction, it would, there was no stopping me. And.
plastic laminated sheet yeah. and pull those out of a bag. So that that's how cranky and old school I am. <laughs> and so in those days, just the idea of a dungeon, the idea of an adventure like Keep on the Borderlands was amazing. Yeah. Okay, uh, so so you you start kind of consuming fantasy fiction. You're doing role playing at the same time. What, was there was there a single point where you put pen to paper and crafted something that you felt like was a a, a well rounded story as opposed to something that was uh, within within another world? If that makes sense. Yeah, I I never wrote fanfic. Um, yeah. Honestly, I started with my own stuff. Started writing fiction really in high school. Mm-hmm. Published a bunch of stuff in my high school literary magazine, uh, which was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, got to college and I actually won a share of the freshman literary prize. Yeah, um, at Wesleyan University, my uh, my freshman year, and that actually led to one of the great terrifying encounters of my literary life, um, because you know I I won part of the freshman writing prize. I thought I was hot stuff, <laughs> and. So I applied for the uh, writer in residences, you know, limited numbers, intensive writing workshop. Yeah. And I submitted my stuff, which was, of course, all genre fiction. Yeah. The writer in question was Annie Dillard, who wrote T- uh, Pilgrim and Tinker's Creek, very much a pillar of the literary fiction community. Mm-hmm. Um, I submitted my stuff. The next day, it came back to my mailbox with the words, we have nothing to say to each other, scrawled on the front. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that devastated me for years. Um, but uh, I, I will be crude here. I now, yeah, I found my way back. I Obviously, I got back into writing. And now every time um, I finish a project, I toss an obscenity Annie Dillard's way just to <laughs> thank you for the motivation. <laughs> that's, the, that's the best response I think you can give. So when when did, or was there a point where you converted or started to mess about in more digital gaming where you moved from pen and paper and and D and and LARPing into um pc or console or you know i guess m- maybe slightly different in the early early stages of gaming but what was your first experience of these uh, i suppose role-playing games in a digital form or a digital gaming um yeah i i played video games way back in the day um you know my my dad had one of those really early consoles from Magnavox that had four varieties of Pong on it. Right. And we thought that was the greatest thing ever. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I was that. I was an Atari 2600 kid. Um, really old school. I didn't... I never got wholly into video games in high school and college the way a lot of my friends did. Yeah. I appreciated them, but I didn't dive deep. Um, you know, I went, out, went about my merry way, went to grad school, moved to Atlanta to work for White Wolf. Mm-hmm. And after about four years at White Wolf, I was sort of hitting a wall creatively. Yeah. Um, I, I had said everything I really felt I needed to say in the tabletop space. Mm-hmm. I had done, you know, Wraith Second Edition. I had done Charnel Houses of Europe. I had done a lot of books. Yeah. Um, I was tired of writing storyteller chapters. Cause mm-hmm. I wrote about seven of those. And a friend of mine named Dave Weinstein, who worked at Red Storm Entertainment, started saying, hey, your stuff is great. You need a bigger challenge come work for us in the video game industry. Yes. And I put him off for a little bit, but he was very persistent. And finally, just to buy myself a little piece, I applied. Mm -hmm. And much to my surprise, I got the job. And I, um, I talked to my manager at White Wolf, Ken Cliff, wonderful guy. And I said, Ken, I just got an offer from a video game company. Um, Here's what they are offering me. I want to give you an opportunity to match it. Yeah. Because I really enjoy working with you. And he took one second and looked at me and said, run, take it now. <laughs> That's a good manager. Yes. So that was, so So you moved into, how, how different, um, like structurally, and we'll get into this a little bit because I'm interested to hear your opinion on where the writer sits in, in, in the video game space. Um I probably I have I have some experience of it in the film space, and I'll talk a little bit around that. I wonder whether it's comparative, uh, but in terms of like structurally and, and and how you how you put things together for a video game in terms of the writing, was that a big leap for you in terms of how you were working from the the tabletop space into into the video game space? Very much so. I mean, there's there's two big differences between going from tabletop to uh, to video games. Yeah. One in tabletop. 
you are in charge, you fix it, you have hands on everything, Mm -hmm. you can make a change up to the last minute, it's, you know, it's all hands on deck, but you are the only hands. Mm -hmm. In video games, you are a very small piece in a very big machine. Yeah. If I want to change a line of dialogue in a big AAA game, it's not just a line of dialogue. I need to talk to the uh, audio guys, I need to talk to the director, we need to record the studio, we need to get the actor... Need to talk to animation. Need to talk to QA. Need to talk to localization. Yeah, mm-hmm. all that for one line change. So that one line change, not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can't just tweak things. It's everything is has dependencies and touches everything else. The other thing is that tabletop design and tabletop writing are designed to look outwards. Mm-hmm. They're designed to give the player and the uh, GM the tools to tell their own stories, expanding beyond what is on the page. Yeah. Good video game design, on the other hand, is about all about moving inwards to the content that already exists. It is about tying the player narrative fantasy to the player gameplay fantasy and making sure the player wants to do what the game does well. Mm-hmm. You don't want to push boundaries in a video game because the animation's not there, the action's not there. Mm. You know, it's, it, it, you know, there's a boundary to the world. Um, you want the player to go to where the money has been spent where the things have been made, where the, you know these the systems have been polished. Mm. That and makes I, sense? I think that's it. It feels like one of the big challenges is it, it's fairly typical of lots of things is making it feel like it's the player's idea to do the things that that you want them to do, kind of guiding yes. them down the right path without making them feel like they're forced. Yes, you want the player to want to do the game. Yeah. So when when you, I suppose one of the first things to do is ask you where you think the writer sits. And I've seen writers in the video game space be called various things, narrative designers and uh, writers and, and et cetera, et cetera. Like where, where do you think they sit? And I suppose for comparison, um, you know, if in the cinematic space, everything almost always starts with a script uh, and then the film is kind of remade twice. It's shot and it's kind of, you know, messed about in shot and then it's edited and it becomes a different film again. So, you know, where does the writer sit in the video game space? Is it still starting with a script or is it a slightly different beast? No. Uh, for, first of all, let me clarify. Writer and narrative designer are two very different tasks. Okay. There's a little overlap sometimes, but a writer is someone who makes words, a narrative designer is someone who makes the narrative systems right. to deliver those words. Yeah. Um, and again, there's overlap. Um, there's people who do both. There's people who who do you know just one? There's people who do just the other, but you know, they're they're separate disciplines or they're okay. separate roles within the narrative discipline. Okay. Um, so that's that's an important distinction, I think, and it's important to give credit to people who do the technical side or, as well as the people who do the creative side. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of where narrative sits, these days it is much better than it used to be. It used to be narrative would get called in at the end of the game, if at all to slap a shiny coat of narrative paint onto what had already been made. Right. Um, And these days, you see a lot more of narrative being involved at the very beginning um, to help conceptualize the the basics of the game before production starts, um, working with the other leads, working with production, working with uh, engineering, working with art, working with creative direction. Mm -hmm. Say, okay, this is the sort of game we want to make. What story supports that? What story shows off those features well? Yeah. And always iterate in conjunction with other folks. But a lot of times, narrative is at the... I won't say at the tail end of the train, because there's always recording and sound Mm -hmm. and QA and Loke after us, but... We are very dependent on other people getting their stuff done. It feels it feels alien. It feels alien to me that 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 would be the case. Um, especially you know, uh, in recent times, you're hearing about games that have you know gone into beta and the 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 narrative design hasn't been there or it's it's struggled and they've they've had to do a lot of work to to rewrite and to rework scripts and stuff and and part of me is thinking how is you know how how are we this far into the process and um and and that's not been right so do you think do you think that, that it's just a necessary part of the process or do you think it is just 
how things have developed and it's how things have always been done even though it might not be the, the best way to do it I think that if you're in beta and you don't know what your story is you have made a serious mistake along the way <laughs> yes yeah um, I, again I'm a big fan of narrative getting in there in the beginning yeah. and doing that editor of feedback big you know big stuff at the beginning smaller stuff as you go along mm-hmm. um, I understand the necessity of waiting for other stuff mm-hmm. um, I can't write to a mission space until that mission space is built. Yeah. Because the characters can't notice details in that space. The characters can't comment on that space. The characters can't point things out in that space until yeah. the space actually exists. Okay. And so that that dependency is necessary. Yeah. Um, that being said, you want to keep those loops as tight and as small as possible. Yeah. To allow for as much time for iteration as possible. Yeah. And to not get to a place where you're at the end and, oh, crap, we need a story now. I mean, I, I can tell you stories of games that I've worked on. Well, literally, I was told, hey, it's Tuesday. We're going to the studio Thursday. Can you please learn, write the game? Yeah. That, thankfully, does not largely happen anymore. Good. But it has happened in the past. And we need to you know, get away from those days and integrate the storytelling narratively and, again, with visual storytelling and things like that as well, mm-hmm. um, as early as possible, so it can get as much polish as possible. Uh, one of my big bugaboos about the industry, honestly, is that um, narrative doesn't get the iteration that it deserves a lot of times yeah. in the way that other departments do because we are towards the tail end of the train. When other folks slip, um, that eats into our time to work and our time to iterate. Mm. But at the same time, on the back end, uh, the studio recording dates aren't going to move and the localization dates aren't going to move, mm. so we don't have the luxury of slipping the way other people do. Yeah, that means we get less time, we get fewer chances to iterate, we get fewer chances to uh, to polish. Yeah, uh, nobody would think of putting a first draft animation in a game. Nobody would put a first pass level space in a game. Nobody would put a first pass character model in a game. But I have worked on too many projects where we put first pass dialogue in a game yeah. because there was no time to polish. It seems. Again, you know, part of me would part of me looks at the video game industry and says, "What an amazing space to to play in." And I'm sure there are moments where that's true. And the other side of me looks at it and goes, "This this feels like it could, uh, on occasion, uh, and I won't have I won't have I won't have you confirm or deny this that it could be a bit of a hellscape." Uh, I was watching uh, I was watching the documentary on the first on the God of War 2018, and it felt like it was make make or break for those guys creating that game and they spent a year getting the first 10 minutes of gameplay for an expo and then Mm -hmm. they only had a year to create the next 30 hours of gameplay to complete the game and for me i was like what a you know what a stressful environment to be in to 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 build all of that out and i'm sure you've experienced that many 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 times Um, yes it's like living in a clive barker novel honestly right you have this glorious imagination of these wonderful moments of realization and spectacle, and at the same time, oh my God, what is that thing lurching towards me? Um, <laughs> and I think what what what's what's interesting to me as well is that you and, and this is like a lot of creative works, and I'm sure you've had this with um, with books and and other bits that you've done is that you as the writer and the whole team within the you know within the gaming space is it, you own that game up until the point that you give it to your users and they then suddenly become the owners of that thing. And it's, it's, it's difficult because I always look at it, and, you know, after watching a couple of these documentaries and researching about oh, right, how a game's made, why is it taking 10 years to make a game now? Why is it taking this amount of time to make a game? You know, why, why is it costing so much money, et cetera, et cetera, all of those questions that I have. So when a game comes out, you know, there's good examples recently like... Um, you know, Gollum is, is, is probably a, a good example that came out recently where I know regardless of how the game turned out, the guys who worked on that didn't go into it the intention of making a bad game. Um, yes. And they would have poured thousands of hours into that. Um, and, and for it to get to the end and, and, and for people to not accept it, whether it was a good game or not, is, is irrelevant because there are very good games that get very bad, um, you know, critique from, from players. You know, mm-hmm. how does it feel when you when you um, spend so much time producing a game, 
you must have a sense of nervousness. Or are you over that now in terms of when it goes out to the community? Do you just allow them to make of what it of it what they will, or or is there a part of you that that is waiting with bated breath breath to see what they say? I was lucky. I got my big bomb out of the way with my first game, basically. Yeah. Um, it was uh, the game at Red Storm. They still refer to it as the game which shall not be named. Um, it was a uh, adaptation of a series of much lesser Anne McCaffrey novels. Right. Um, and it was it was a bad idea from the beginning, compounded by many bad ideas along the way. <laughs> uh, the team worked its heart out on that game. Yeah. Um, but it was doomed from the get go and it became something of an internet punching bag because the, uh, the, the satirical review site, old man Murray ran a video where they claimed that our game blew up their monitor. <laughs> now this was not the case, but you know, was the, we became the punching bag and they wrote just as utterly savage, vicious, really nasty review where they're talking about how everybody who worked on the game needs to die in a fire and their families needed to die in a fire. Yeah. And, and everybody thought this was hilarious. And that was my first real game. So my first game as a lead designer. Yeah. And so, you know, that was being tossed into the, the caldera of molten lava from the get go. Yeah. Um, I and the whole team had worked ourselves to the bone on that game against really adverse circumstances and you know, here was some chucklehead saying, "Ha ha, you all just should die." And uh, it seems that, that it, it seems like an industry where it is you don't seem to get the same the, very visceral responses in the video game industry compared to almost every other industry. There's critique in every other industry, but it doesn't seem to be as vitriolic as as the gaming industry can be sometimes. Yeah, I think that's because the uh, the feedback to video games really was born online, right? Where you, yeah, you know, there's the lack of accountability. People can hide behind their uh, their usernames. Yeah, and yeah, but that's neither here nor there. The point being that you know this that was my first foray into public critique of my video game work. Yeah, and so nothing has been as bad as, as that since then, and I learned to take it and. You know, I, I always have that to say, well, is it as bad as dying in a fire? No, we're good. Um, <laughs> so you, at this, so yeah, at this point, it's, it's the game is what it is. I put my best effort into it. I know that the folks I'm working with have put their best efforts into it. Um, I tr Nobody says that to make a bad game. Everybody wants to make the best game possible. Um, the shirkers and the, uh, the clock watchers tend not to last that long mm -hmm. um, because you want to do something right. You want to do something good. Um, and so all you can do is do your best and put it out there and hope people like it. Mm. And if somebody has a recent critique why they didn't like it, you can say, thank you. I you know, appreciate that. Yeah. If somebody likes it, you say, thank you because um, you know, they're saying something nice about your work. And if they say something horrible, you say, thank you. Sorry. You didn't like it. Yeah. And move on because you know, I'm not going to change that person's mind. And it is not appropriate to, to engage on that level because it's not an even conversation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with, with, I'm curious to understand because, because developing like the narrative, narrative arc, Developing the narrative art for a video game seems like a uh, a completely possible endeavor to me. You know, in terms of this is where our main character starts. This is this is the this is the broad arc, and this is where we want them to end up. The thing that kind of blows my mind and makes me it makes me feel a little bit like I'm trying to comprehend the size of the universe, certainly with open world games and how large games are getting now, is how do you map out and think about and maybe there's a secret here, all of the possible different interactions and, and NPCs and all of these various things that you might see in an open world game, that a very large open world game, how do you even start to think about how that might look? For me, putting that on paper feels mm -hmm. like it is, it is infinite, you know. I, I suppose that's part of the beauty of the game is that it feels like it doesn't have boundaries, but how do you even start to think about all of those possible variations? It used to be with a lot of post-it notes, but uh, <laughs> we've graduated to Miro now. Right. Um, now, the, there's a couple of 
details you have to understand before you go into that. Okay. Uh, one is that the player's journey is always linear. Yes. Space may not be linear. The opportunities they run into may not be linear, but they always go A to B to C. Yes. It's just their particular A to B to C. Yes. And that always has to make sense. Yes. Um, we write to what I call the player-shaped hole. The hero of a game is not the main character. The hero of a game is the player. Um, right. or to, to put it another way, have you ever told a story about something you did in a video game? Yes. What was the first word of that story? I. Uh-huh. <laughs> and this is not the first time I've dragged out that example. Um, and it's always I. Yes. Um, because, and the player is the hero. It's what the player does. What we do, and this is the dirty little secret, is we do not write the story. Mm -hmm. We write the props. We write the set dressing. We write all the tools and toys and pieces and bits and bobs the player is going to interact with and make their own story as they play through. We do narrative. The player does a story as they play, as they come into contact with all the narrative tools and pieces we have made. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that, that's been my definition for 15 years now. And I haven't had anybody talk me out of it yet. And do do you think do you think that will remain the same? I mean, games seem to be getting bigger, more complex, more open. Still, with you know, with um, with these linear these you know, there is still the linear story in the middle, but this illusion of, of more openness on the outside. They seem to be getting longer to make. Um, and more expensive to make, um, and, and all of those things. Uh, do you think th that we will see that regress back at all in order to, to make it more sustainable, or do you think that that will kind of continue exponentially along with the, the technology allowing it to do that? Um, I think we're going to see a broadening of the spectrum, honestly. Mm -hmm. As long as the technology advances, people are going to want to push that to make bigger and bigger games. Mm -hmm. That's why games are taking longer. There's a bigger bucket to fill. Yeah. That's why they're more expensive. It takes more people to fill that bucket. Yeah. At the same time, we're seeing such a wonderful explosion of indie games and small games and short games mm. for people who don't want that, you know, 300 hour experience for people who want to sit down and play a complete experience in two hours or whatever mm. else. And I firmly believe that, as an entertainment medium, games are broader than anything else because you cover everything from, you know, match threes on your phone to MMOs to open world games to, you know, walking simulators to fighting games. You know, these, a book is a book is a book. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different bits of content in a book, but a book is a book. Yeah. A movie is a movie is a movie. Um, lots of different content, but it's still, you know, you put in the projector, it starts, it goes, it ends. Mm-hmm. Games don't work like that. Games barely fit in the big tent, which is bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. And we have so many possibilities and so many ways to call something a game. Um, and it is constantly expanding. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, you know, one of the things I loved about a Nintendo Switch was getting to play these very, very short, small games where every frame felt like a, a piece of artwork, every frame of it felt like something you could take and put on a wall and it would look beautiful, thinking of things like, you know, Inside and uh, Limbo and um, yes. uh, Lone Sales, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They all felt like really beautiful games. They didn't feel less than things like uh, Far Cry or, or, or Red Dead Redemption. They didn't feel less, they just felt different. You know, it was a different experience. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, sometimes you want the, uh, the full rib house... You know, ribeye steak, yep. and sometimes you want a snack. Uh, <laughs> That's it. Sometimes the full meal is you just can't face it. That sometimes you just yeah. need, especially with. Uh, I think. Um, I think one of the things I read about your writing was that you loved writing uh, dialogue for bad guys, where where people <laughs> people didn't want to didn't want to kill the bad guys because they they felt too much for them and I think that's one of the hard things about games is certainly some of these big emotional games is they are they are really taxing on you. You know, they, they they really take it out of you when you when you're playing them because you get so invested in those characters. Yes, is that is that and something I, I you discovered by accident? The um, the the that you liked writing for making the bad guys relatable, making them people invested in them. 
yeah. Everybody's got a story. Every character is a character. Every character has a motivation. Yeah. And I have always wanted um, to have every character in every game that I write feel like they belong there and they have a purpose in the world. Mm -hmm. That if the camera were placed differently, they would be the star of the story. Yeah. Now, the guys in particular are talking about it from the original Far Cry. Yeah. And I, I refer to them as sand guys. Um, I, the original Far Cry was an island hopping adventure game yeah. um, where at various points you got the ability to eavesdrop on characters from long distance, yeah. which meant that all of the guards had to have dialogue that was worth eavesdropping on. Right. And there were a lot of guards. <laughs> and at one point I just sat there for a minute and went, okay, right, I'm broken, I'm out. Let's talk about sand. They're on a beach, let's talk about sand. <laughs> And so I have these two guys talking, and one of them is talking about how much he hates sand and it gets in his shoes and whatever else, yeah. which is a perfectly human thing to say. And the other guy is like, no, I grew up in Philly, and I would go down to the Jersey Shore all the time when I was a kid, and we loved the beach. And, you know, just a little personal moment. Yeah. It mattered nothing to the larger plot. It mattered nothing to the game as a whole. It just humanized that guy and gave, you know, him a personality and a life that took him beyond being just a gun rack with feet. Yeah. And so I was at E3 2005, I want to say, and I got surrounded by this swarm of students from New Jersey who wanted to talk to me about the sand guys. <laughs> because they were playing, and they overheard that conversation. Like, no, we can't shoot this guy. We know this guy. We are this guy. <laughs> that must have been a pretty amazing moment. I mean, had you considered that that was even – was that the moment for you where you – was that a realization point for you where you went, ah, that bit of – throwaway matters did you think did you realize yes. the impact that would have when you were writing it or no i absolutely did not realize the impact when i was writing it but you know that was a you know moment of realization you know that was a bolt of blue lightning yeah to uh to really make me understand and that's something that i've carried forward you know 20 years since then i mean what what a, what an amazing thing to to stumble upon it's um and and for something that I assume that new, newer people coming in the industry, where you get to say to them, "Hey, this isn't this isn't just like grunt work. This this stuff matters, and here's why." Um, one of, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, a lot a lot of the games that you've that you've helped to produce have been uh, based off um, pre-existing work, I guess, from from other formats. You, you you mentioned one of your first games being from a from an existing novel. Uh, yes. Do you? Do you feel like you're handling kind of someone else's art there when you're doing that? Is there a, is there a part of you where you're saying we need to take care with, we need to take care with this, like an adaption of a film where you're saying we need to make sure this is true to form, or do you see it as what we're doing is we're we're kind of completely adapting it, and and so it's really about what we do in the video game space rather than staying true to form? Like, how do you feel about adapting um, pre existing work? Yes. Um, yeah, yes to both. Yeah. What you want to do when you're adapting stuff, and then, you know, largely my work at Ubi was with Tom Clancy stuff. Yeah. And what I wanted to do and what we wanted to do was respect the pillars of the Tom Clancy franchise, mm -hmm. the things that made something absolutely Tom Clancy, the thing, you know, the outline of the golden circle of Tom Clancy-ness, mm -hmm. uh, without having to recreate stuff that was good for a book that wasn't good for a video game. Right. They're different media. You tell different stories in different ways. Um, you can tell stories that fit under the same umbrella, but they're different stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought long and hard about, you know, what are the pillars of the Tom Clancy's brand? And, you know, came down to a few core items yeah. um, that I applied, whether I was doing Rainbow Six or I was doing a Ghost Recon mm -hmm. or a Splinter Cell or Hawks or End War. Uh, or the division, and you know that drew the circle on the ground, and I could look at story elements and things that people proposed and say, "Yes, this fits." No, it doesn't. You want to be respectful of the material yeah. because people love that material. There's a reason you're adapting that material, mm -hmm. and it's because people love it and people want more of it. Mm -hmm. You want you don't want to say, "Ha, you're stupid. You're wrong." Here's what it's really like. Yeah. You want to um, you want to respect the thing that drew people to that material in the first place. At the same time, you can't give them slavish. Um, recreation because it doesn't work. Yeah. And is that something? Is that something that? Is that something you realized early on when you were, were adapting other people's work? You mentioned with the, you know the first project being a, a tough one. Was that part of the? Was that part of the challenge there, or is it just something that you knew innately when you started to adapt this stuff that it wasn't 
not everything was necessarily fit for purpose when it came to video games. Well, you know, I started in tabletop with White Wolf. Yeah. And, you know, those were established franchises. Those were established IPs mm -hmm. um, where I came on to write. In some cases, I helped create them at the beginning. In some cases, I landed on ones that were already fully formed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was used to playing in a sandbox that had already been built where the walls were already in place. Yeah. And I could concentrate on not reinventing the world every time I put pen to paper, but rather saying, okay, here's my defined space. Here's where I can get creative in it and I can get more granular and detailed. Mm -hmm. And so that valuable lesson from tabletop uh, came with me to video games. And do you, do you think, do you think that the, the video games are, does it, does it feel like, although there's obviously going to be differences in structure and, and form, do you feel like they're a natural progression of one another uh, in terms of, of like, like you were saying earlier, it's, it's the player that's the hero. It's, it's them, they're really writing the story and you're really providing the framework for them to be able to do that. Do you feel like that basis in, in tabletop was is an important part for how video games look now? Is, is, there a lot, is there a lot of the industry based on people who had their start in that tabletop space? There was for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of strict lineage, I think the strongest through line is from Choose Your Own Adventures and things like that, mm -hmm. and tabletop RPGs through to video games. There's the constant desire to compare us to film, but interactivity is a huge thing. You get that in tabletop, you get that in LARP, you don't get that in film. Yes. Yeah. And and so I think the the tabletop lineage is perhaps more accurate. We can create the spectacle of film, but at the heart of the game space, mm -hmm. you go back to tabletop RPG. Yes. Well, let's let's talk about that for a little minute because I feel like this is an interesting part of games and something that divides people is the cinematics and and the cutscenes. Um, I see people that that complain about not being enough cutscenes. There's some people that complain about cutscenes being too long or games having too many cutscenes and cinematics. I personally love that that as as a, a type of game, you know, where where it's not it's not really necessarily about the gameplay, but it's about the story and and the and the you know those cutscenes are a huge part of that. Um, is that a different element of of you know, building out the, the structure of a game and the writing of a game, you know, is that an important part for you as a, as a writer and a, a, a narrative designer to, to figure out where those cutscenes go and where they naturally fit? Um, it feels like it would be a nice chunky piece of work to go, this is, you know, the, these are the big story footprints for me in, in the game. You know, how do you feel about those cutscenes? Okay, I, I'm going to tell you a story from years ago. Yeah. Um, I was uh, invited to uh, speak on a panel on game writing at NYU, yeah. um, aspiring writers uh, from the screenwriting program who were interested in writing games. Mm -hmm. And they all wanted to write the meaty stuff. They all wanted to write the cutscenes, the cinematics, the big splashy stuff. Yeah. And then I said, okay, how many of you skip the cinematics when you play? And they all stuck their hands up. And I went, uh-huh. <laughs> and there was this moment of, ooh, yeah. Um, I was surprised by how many people did that. Because I... Um, I suppose it depends on the game for me, but you know, there's there's definitely there's definitely certain games where I feel like it is a, a kind of treachery to <laughs> to, to skip a cutscene. It's, it's it depends on what you're using your cutscene for. Yeah, it depends on what you're using your cinematic for. If it's a reward to the player, that's one thing. Yeah. If it is a natural culmination of the experience, that's another thing. Mm. If it is a way of papering over a hole in your game that your gameplay can't handle. It is a little trickier. Yeah. Um, I am not a huge fan of the big spectacular cutscene that shows the player things they cannot do. Right. I don't want to make a promise that uh, can't the game can't deliver. Yes. Yeah. So, in, like, I, I suppose uh, movement and mechanics and functions and features that that are only possible within a cinematic and aren't actual. You know, that kind of this is not actual in-game footage type type ad type stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. And you, you want to control the action, but at the same time, you don't want to uh, say, okay, here's all the cool stuff your character's doing that you can't do. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the real, the other landmine is the talking cinematic. Right. 
when you have information that you need to get to the player and there's no other way to get to the player than to lock their feet and have someone talk at them. Yeah. And those cinematics are death. And I know because I've written a ton of them. Um, <laughs> but there's times when they literally are not the design mechanics in the game to communicate that information in any other way. Yeah. I suppose those feel a little bit more like... Um... You know, I think a, a lot of a lot of writers will say show show don't tell whenever you can, um, and I suppose the same applies to video games, right? If you can yes. show people through the mechanics of the game how to do things and how to achieve things, rather than having someone say pick this up and put that in there, and you know, actually kind of guide them through, uh, it's it's always yeah. going to be better. And it's not even that it's backstory for a game that the game can't supply yeah. um, within the within the game space. Um, I'll throw you an example from the last game I did for Ubisoft, which was Assassin's Creed Nexus. Yes. Wonderful game. I have nothing but good things to say about the team I worked with, mm -hmm. um, and the, particularly the narrative folks I worked with on that game. Yeah. Worked hard, took an impossible task, and made something really good out of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we had gameplay in the historical sections when you're running around assassinating people, and they had their story. But we had to put together a story that tied together all of these other things that you were doing. Yeah. And we didn't have gameplay to tie it together with. Yeah. And so we had to do cinematics. We had to find a way to do cinematics where we explained all of these concepts, these uh, crazy sci-fi concepts that underpin Assassin's Creed, and do that in a way that was tight, that was controlled, that was brief, that um, informed the action the player was actually doing, mm -hmm. and that they didn't want to skip. And that was hard. That was really hard. And we wrote out everything they need to know, and it was way too long. And then we wrote it out much shorter. I was like, no, we, they need to know these things that got chopped out. And uh, <laughs> yeah, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, what you absolutely want to avoid is the dreaded, as you know, Bob. <laughs> as you know, here's something you definitely didn't know. <laughs> yes. as, as you, the character, know, here's something the player didn't know. Yeah. And yes, so that is... As you know, Bob has become a running joke on every narrative team that I've worked on. <laughs> I refuse to let it be anything but a joke. <laughs> okay, so uh, with with you, you seem to have worked on a lot of games where there's, you know, looking down your list, considering how game, how long games take to 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 create, um, you have consistently been working on games, you know, year over year over year um, for for a long time now. Um, and like I said at the, at the very beginning, this seems to be incredibly prolific. Um, is the is there is there an issue? Do you think with pace in the in the um, in the video game industry? Because there seems to be two ends of the scale for me. You've got the the rock star end of the scale. Let's call it that. Where you've got uh, this is a this is a decade long project, maybe longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, then you've got the these are these are just ends of the scale rather than being specific games and you know no no, no issues with either side of this. Then you've got the kind of Call of Duty side where it's like we will produce a game every every year, um, and and there's obviously huge differences in the how those things progress from a story perspective, from a gameplay perspective, from lots of perspectives. It's like you know I imagine GTA Six will be very very different to. GTA 5 in terms of size and scope and all of those things whereas the next Call of Duty game probably won't be that dissimilar to the previous one and I know there's lots of games that struggle with that they they need to push for pace because it's a cash cow they need to get a game out every year because it produces huge amounts of money how, how do you feel do you feel like they're just both necessary parts of the industry or do you think that on the one side it the, the game isn't progressing enough to, to justify producing a game every year um i'm just curious about that because for me it's like how can how can on one side they're very different games i get that but it's like yeah. on one side you've got people producing yearly on the other side you've got people producing uh, every decade and they're very different games but it seems like such a big chasm between the two for me well let me, let me clarify something it's not the same studio turning out the call of duty yes game. yeah i'm aware that they, it's they multiple have studios games. they're on multiple year cycles they have time to innovate they have time to do new stuff yeah. um so you know it's it's not, they're not a sports franchise where you uh, go back to the basic rules of the game year over year, update the rosters, yeah. try and get a new feature. And, and again, nothing against sports games. They have done some incredibly innovative storytelling over the last decade or so. Yeah. But is the franchise model is very different from 
the uh, in the Baldur's Gate three model or the uh, GTA model. Mm-hmm. Um, I say good for the companies that can afford to put eight years um, into a project to make it as good as humanly possible yeah. and invest the money um, with the expectation that they will create something that is worth that investment. Yeah. I think it's great that we have games that are that ambitious. I think it's great that we have games that take these giant swings. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they come out great, I mean, how pe- people are still playing GTA five people, how people are still playing vice city as far as I know. Um, yeah. And those, and those and, games, they hold up. I mean, I, uh, my, my story very, very briefly is that I'm, I'm fairly new back into gaming really since the, the PlayStation five was released is when I really got back into gaming. I played switch a bit before that. I only played GTA Five. In fact, GTA Five and Red Dead Redemption Two, the kind of the big Rockstar games, I only played them in the past couple of years. And those games, considering you know they they are in, in technology terms, ten years old is, is you know ten and yeah. fifteen years old is, is a long time. They hold up really well. They they are they stand up next to a lot of games that have been produced very very recently. So I yeah. guess that yeah. that decade that goes into that really shows you know. Yeah, the the experience is so polished. And so crafted that it endures. Mm-hmm. And I think it's great, again, that there are companies that can afford to do that and make things on that level. Mm-hmm. Um, I also understand they need to keep the lights on. Um, and as a franchise that people want installments of, um, then, you know, by all means, feed that need, feed that appetite. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you can do it creatively and feel you're doing good work year in and year out, and people do, mm-hmm. then more power to them. Yeah. Um, where it gets tricky is sort of the no man's land of shovelware and in a game that's supposed to be a small game and then there's feature creep and then it gets added on and then it gets torn down and then it gets rebuilt. and mm-hmm. That's where it gets messy. That's when you get a game that's been in production for eight years, but it's only really been in production for two years because the three six years of work got thrown out. And yeah. yeah. And the other big, there's a couple of other big, kind of question marks for me 